Green. Wonderful. I, I'm just going to admire Richard. He's got three layers on. <laughs> Respect for a man who can wear three layers and still not sweat buckets. Amazing. Great job. Well done, Richard. <laughs> sorry. Oh, blessing. Uh, yeah, sorry. As Richard said, my name is Neil. Uh, if you're new here, I'm the vicar. It's great to have you. And we're just continuing our two part series. Last week we looked at creation, uh, hope for creation, and this week we're looking at our response. And I just thought I'd. Um, I'd uh, we've had Billy, one of our kind of tier fund experts, if you want to see it that way. Um, so I thought I'd uh, go to the source. I'd go to our very own expert in everything nature, and uh, I asked Paul Collingridge, you all thought I'd probably get there in the end at some point, uh, to put together a five-minute wonder of worship video, a wonder of creation. So, hopefully this will now work, and we can be marveled. to see amazing animals or observe how granite can be spiralled up like a Swiss roll or watch a newborn fawn's first steps. Though you probably expect me to walk you through ancient forest and extol the beauty of the woodland floor or maybe you're hoping for Sir David Attenborough to vicariously reveal the sights he visits on our large and small screens. But I find an enlightening way to see the hand of God in creation is to stop and look more clearly at the detail he put in. Let me show you some examples from on our own doorstep within two minutes walk of the church and possibly in our own garden. Let's have a go by looking at this simple oak leaf. On it, we can see an oak gall. Now, when a mother oak gall wasp laid an egg here, God gave it the ability to trick the oak leaf into growing its offspring a home. Now, there are more than 7,000 species of wasp in the UK, and thankfully only one or two of them can sting you. The rest are totally harmless and so tiny that you'll probably never notice them at all. They are all, however, spectacular and amazing. This oak gall home is so safe that there is a dozen other microscopic wasps that will usually move in too, living happily alongside the first. And there is also a dozen or more species of wasp that are specific parasites of those wasps. So this one gall may contain dozens of wasps, up to 25 species at a time. And there may be 10,000 galls on a single tree. And there are over 200 types of oak gall. Now that's what we can see as God's detail, and ecologists call it species biodiversity. Trillions upon trillions of organisms on the planet, all a bit different, all a bit similar. These overlaps and differences keeping the planet in balance, accommodating change. It's amazing how incredible this gift of creation is, and we have been purposefully gifted it by the Creator, all of it, out of his love, his three great gifts of life. Life in his image, all created life, and a new eternal life. Just imagine the pleasure it gives God when we open this precious gift every day and say, wow, that is amazing, thanks, I absolutely love it. And it all matters, not just the cute ones, but the weird, the unusual, and frankly the intimidating looking ones too. Here's another wasp, God made it to use its antennae to detect beetle grubs several centimetres below the surface of my apple tree and then it begins laying eggs directly into them and without these most trees would fall apart very rapidly and as well as just looking we can use all our senses we can taste the shocking apple peel piquancy of the wood sorrel we can smell the glorious richness of 10 billion actinomycetes and a single handful of forest soil we can feel the always warm trunk of a giant redwood tree. We can listen for hours on end to the always new melodies of the song thrush. And there's just as much nature below the soil. Trillions of living, breathing microorganisms creating and constantly improving the soil to keep the plants growing, far outweighing the living mass above the ground to the point where scientists are now questioning who controls who. It seems that fungi farm forests in much the same way that humans farm grain. And if you get a microscope and the wondrous detail of God's hand in everything stands out further, 
Here we have oak, sycamore and pine that tell the scientist exactly what types of wild flower will live beneath. And some grass is here from our sandy soils. And have you ever wondered where mushrooms disappeared to? Or maybe they were dismantled by God's natural countryside wardens, the dung beetles. Some live almost their entire life hidden inside the stems of plants. And consider the orchids of the field whose seed cannot germinate until fed by just the right kind of tree root dwelling fungus. And then there's the silver studded blue butterfly whose caterpillar is nurtured by ants as some type of superior queen ant. Or creatures that look like dead bits of plant, lizards that look like snakes, spectacular sunsets that follow rainy days. If we seek God's intentions for our resources and use this planet well as God intended, we could easily feed the world and clothe the world. It could be that when this incredible precision from the hand of God is repeatedly and needlessly damaged by the hand of man, we're showing God that his precious gift is less important to us than the things that we choose. A me first world like picking the fruit from a forbidden tree who fail to connect with what arises from the love of God for us, choosing an anodyne existence over life alongside the glory of God. So let's not miss out on God's plan for this gift for us. Let's celebrate how it looks and how it works. Let's treasure it, wonder at it, experience divine joy and then turn gratefully to look full into the face of the Creator who loves us more than the whole universe could imagine. It's time to receive his gift and say, wow, that's amazing. Thanks. I love it. Let's pray. Wow. That's amazing. Thanks, Lord. We absolutely love it. Lord, help us to take care of it. Amen. Amen. Can we swap to the computer? My computer, please. Thank you. So, we're going to be quickly, uh, I'm going to be looking at, I looked at the time Richard gave me and I thought, oh, he was saying something to me. Keep it short and sweet, Neil. Good luck. Um, okay, so creation care, our response. This is going to be very, very fast, okay? But I want you to understand. I want you to just remember these words in your head. It's a bit like what Billy said. Do something. Don't do nothing. Okay, do something. Don't do nothing. It's very easy with all the information that we get given, everything that we just kind of, we go into paralysis and just go, oh, I don't know what to do, and we just stop. Do something and start from there. Well, last week we looked at the hope of creation. We looked at our relationship with planet Earth. Do listen to that sermon uh, online. We learned that actually that because of human sin, the ground is cursed. The planet is living with the effects of our sin of human beings, and it still is. In the Old Testament, the psalmist saw that the creation praised God. We heard about the trees of the fields and all the streams giving glorious praise out to the Lord and actually being called as people to bring praise as part of creation. We are inspired by creation, but we are created as well. So we give our praise as part of creation as well. Then we saw Jesus did not make any specific references to climate change, but we talked about how the fact that when Jesus says, love your neighbor, we have to understand that how we deal with the planet doesn't, may not affect our direct next door neighbor, but it affects people in the world. And probably 80% of the poorest people in the world are being affected by 20% of our of our kind of climate destruction, basically. So we are affecting poor people. We are contributing to the flooding of lands in other places, of Bangladesh, of places like that. So loving our neighbor, creation care comes into that because if we care for creation, we therefore love our neighbors. And then we saw the hope of creation, that creation is going to be renewed, that actually there's going to be the original goodness of creation right at the very end time when Jesus calls time and he comes down and dwells with his people and he calls the living and the dead to be with him. He renews creation. He doesn't just kick it out and make a new one. He renews creation. So there's this whole thing that creation is part of what God is doing. It's part of everything about the kingdom of God. So the question then comes is, what is our response? Well, we had our reading from Matthew 8, 18 uh, to 22. And I kind of want to just talk very briefly about stuff. Now, my loft, 
It was one of the things when I was looking around for curacies, the people for vic, vic, new vicar places. Jules will testify this is that as I was going around, I would go around the houses. The church was great, it was fantastic. The first thing I did was shove my head up in the loft. Why? Because I wanted to see how big the loft was. Because guess what? Our loft is stuffed with stuff. I don't know about you, uh, I'm not proud of it. Some of it's a lot of Christmas decorations. Probably a third of the loft is Christmas decorations. But the thing is, we as a people now accumulate stuff. We accumulate things because it's now part of our lifestyle. At one click away, we can get more stuff. The ease of online shopping, the instant nature of Amazon, it means this stuff can become part of our fabric of life. And this phrase in Matthew 8 that we read is, in a way, encapsulates the whole cost of discipleship. You know, Jesus says, all animals have homes, but Jesus has nowhere to lay his head. I thought that was really interesting. Here he is, the Son of God. God is saying, look at these creatures. They have somewhere to live, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. Well, we know that he does lay his head with maybe in other people's homes when they put, give him shelter for the night, or he might lay down on the side of the road if it's been a long walk. So he, he lays his head. So what's he, what's he actually saying? And when he asks us to follow like him, what is the implication of the cost of discipleship? See, I think it's about a simpler living. It's about living simply. Now, Jesus does ask the man, other people to go out and sell all their possessions. Now, does that mean I go out and sell, or we go out and sell all our guitars, our gadgets, our computers, our TVs, our crafting equipment, our cars, caravans, tents, fridges, washing machines, desks, sofas, trinkets, jewelry, watches, lamps, clocks, printers, books, Kindles, rugs, bikes, surfboards, skateboards, bodyboards, ironing boards, shoes, shelves, wardrobes, beds, curtains, baths, hot tubs. Anybody got hot tubs? Shavers, pens, pads, magazines, garden furniture, lawn mowers, greenhouses, strimmers, secateurs, and the, 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 the list goes on. Do we go and sell all that to follow Jesus? Well, I think we have to understand that Jesus is talking about living a simpler life. He's saying, look, your world is full of stuff. Live simply for me. Now, we know in Luke 8 that there are some women who follow Jesus, who supported the disciples in the ministry. So they didn't go out and sell all their stuff. They didn't sell all their homes. They supported the disciples as they went round. They put them up. They fed them out of their own means. And in Acts 2, we read that the people of God had everything in common. So some of them sold stuff as people were in need. So they must have had stuff in order to sell stuff to help people who didn't have any stuff because they were in need. So Jesus is not just saying, right, flog everything, and then we're all going, oh, we've got nothing. There is a point to this phrase that he's saying. He's saying, live simply. The cost of discipleship is about our lifestyle. Every footprint we make is about following Jesus, and our footprint on the environment is part of that. So how do we live simply in order to help creation, to care for creation? Well, we could go straight into the concept of consumption. Let's be honest, we do consume, and I am talking to myself. Now, you've got to hear me, right? I'm not just saying, look at me, because this has been a hard lesson for me about my consumption, about my loft, about the stuff that I look for. This is a journey that we are going on as a church. This is a place where we as a people are going, if this is about my lifestyle, how do I change? My consumption has to change. How I buy things, our habits need to be addressed. We may feel better because companies are having electric fleets to deliver our stuff, but the very stuff that we're throwing away so the electric vehicles can come and deliver stuff to us is just going to landfill when it could be fixed. It's interesting, I was reading a book and it said part of creation care is tithing. You're thinking, oh, you're going to squeeze that one in, Neil. How, what does that mean? Tithing, well, a lot of, 
I kind of just said, well, is it an Old Testament principle? Well, yes and no, because you heard my teacher on tithing before. But tithing is a good principle about consumption, because if we give the money away, 10%, then we have less to consume, to use to buy more stuff. It's saying, I'm going to put priority on kingdom work rather than Amazon work. If you're watching, Jeff, let's... See, simplicity is the key. Longevity is essential. Now, I'm a work in progress. I am a product of the 80s and 90s. Plastic was all around. Everything was plastic. And it's right, let's start to change our plastic. Lifestyle was dictated in the decades. And we all have learned different things in the times of, our, of the century that we've lived most of our life. So some of us will come from post-war area where we've been... You learn to, to live with what you've got. You don't spend what you don't have. Some of us are now in areas where actually you spend what you don't have and you spend the rest of your life paying it off. There's a different way that many of us are operating, but we need to look at this. So, in the last... Uh, right, let's click the next slide. Oh, that'd be me, not you, sorry. <laughs> Winner. Uh, on. There we go, so Matthew 18. So it's living a full and simpler life. Okay, so let's look at our personal life, okay? So here's the thing. Paul gave us a wonderful video. Get outside. Go outside and start having a look at the creation. Go into the countryside. Suck in some air. Get some fresh air in us. Outside in the countryside, you don't have to wear a mask, okay? Breathe it in. Look at the wonder and the beauty of what we're part of. Reuse, reduce, recycle, repair, recover, respect. Who watches the repair shop? There we go. Great program. But it's all about repairing stuff of the old. Let's repair stuff. Okay, so let's look at our power and our heat. Okay, now remember I said do something. You may do all of this, but don't do nothing. Do something. Solar panels. Maybe you might want to start thinking about solar panels on your roof if you can afford it, if you can work that one through. Offset your own carbon footprint. There are plenty of websites, and we'll put this on the church website in the coming weeks, of websites you can go on and you can input your energy use as a household, and then you can offset your carbon footprint. If you're going to get a car next time, and I say next time, think seriously about electric. I know this divides opinion, but it is worth us looking at. But he's already said, have a look at our gas and electricity supplies to be greener, to use renewable energy. Let's use reusable bags. Obviously, they've been produced for under plastic. Let's try and make sure that we don't use plastic bags. Let's use reusable bags. Turn off your wireless router at night. Switch off the plug socket. I know how frustrating it is to plug it on and wait for it to boot up. I know that. I love my children, but every time the router has to reboot, there's a, because <sighs> everything's so slow. I live in the 80s where it took you half an hour just to upload a computer game, and if it crashed at 29 minutes, you had to start again. That doesn't make me better. It just means we're living in a different era. Turn your router off because it's not going to be used for eight, nine hours whilst you're asleep. Save heating by opening the blinds or curtains. That saves 10% energy saving. Turn off lights. Oh, man alive, that's a mantra in everybody's house, isn't it? Can you turn off the light, please? But turning off lights does save it. See, turning off your lights for just one hour a day will save 1.22 pounds of CO2. Over a course of a year, this adds up to 0.216 metric tons. Although that might not sound like much, I know, but the overall impact of every household doing this is enormous. We can replace our bulbs with energy-saving bulbs. We can lower the temperature on our hot water heaters for the wintertime. Unplug the TV. TVs are usually left for 17 hours and not being used. Even on standby, it will use energy. If you've got a fire, use smokeless fuel. Coffee logs. I'll get coffee into my fire, you see. You can get coffee logs. I know they're expensive, but maybe mix them in with some of the other fuel that you have. But look to go to smokeless. Okay, let's move to our kitchen. Is your fridge in a shady place? Did you know if it's in sunlight, your fridge will work harder? Did you know that? If your fridge is in direct sunlight, it will work harder to stay cooler, therefore using more energy. Avoid pre-rinse or dishwashing. So how many of us pre-rinse our, our washers beforehand? You know, we go, some people do. Avoid pre-rinsing your, dish your dishwashing. 
if you've got a dishwasher, that is. Always run stuff on a full load. Don't run it on a half load. When you have to buy a new appliance, make sure they're eco-friendly. Look at the credentials. It may mean 50 quid more. It may mean 30 quid more. But look at moving eco-friendly. Look at greener household cleaning products. Use cloths that you put in the, dish wa in the washing machine rather than paper towels to wipe tables up. Let's look at other stuff. How about repurposing old furniture? Ask someone if you can borrow something before you buy it. Did you know plants in the house purify the air? That's pretty good. If something is broken, maybe somebody here can fix it. And here's the question for me, is when I go to upgrade my phone, do I go for the new flashiest phone or do I just replace the SIM card? The amount of phones that are thrown away is ridiculous. Do I just replace the SIM card and keep the phone until the phone breaks? Holidays. Why not have a holiday in the UK? And if you do fly abroad, fantastic, but why not offset the carbon emissions that you use on the plane? You can do that through websites. Here's a good one. Personal hygiene. Oh, have less baths and more showers. Well, that went down like a lead balloon. Okay. Turn off the tap when you're brushing your teeth. Recycle toilet paper. If you're going to upgrade your loo, install a, install a low flow toilet. Food. Are your, okay, let's think of bottles. Are your drinking bottles, do you go to a shop and buy Evian water or something like that? Don't. Just get a water bottle and take it with you. Just really simple because the plastic will just get thrown away and it will just land in another country somewhere. Food waste. Man, we could go on this, but did you know food waste generates methane? You must do because I've been going on about it enough times. Food waste generates methane. It's the stuff that comes out at the end of cows. Okay. Now, here's the thing. It's more dangerous for the greenhouse effect for our environment than CO2. Methane is more potent than CO2. So this is a quite a serious thing. These are facts from Paul. 49 million square kilometers is used to produce, is used to produce food for people on Earth. 33%, get those, 33% of all food produced is wasted. 33%. So if it's wasted and just thrown away, that food is just left to do what? To rot and produce methane. That's why we've got the community fridge, to stop food being thrown away. If all food, was, all food waste was eliminated, it would free up the equivalent land mass of the USA plus Australia. Huge, isn't it? So not wasting our food is key to helping our environment. Talk about reduce our meat consumption, reduce beef consumption, eat less meat. Have a water bottle, as I said, not shop-bought water. Do we buy British? Do we actually look at the labels on our packaging and go, hmm. The one program I recommend you to watch is Mediterranean with Simon, oh, what's his name? Simon Reeve, there we go. I love those programs. I've got his name because I love the program. But watch Simon Reeve Mediterranean if you can. And when he gets to Spain, you'll see the fields, and I'm talking cities of polytunnels that are producing strawberries for us. And you see where all the plastic from the polytunnels go. So I'm trying my hardest not to buy strawberries from Spain, but actually from Great Britain because it's all about seasonal veg. They actually, just look, start investing in looking at programs and seeing, wow, I didn't realize that, and seeing that actually migrants are going to these polytunnels and they're living 15 to 20 people in a house that's not worthy for my dog just to produce strawberries for our supermarkets. Ow. Go on, I'm getting a bit thirsty now. Compost kitchen scraps. There we go. That was a simple one. Clothes. Fast fashion. Let's not try and keep buying new stuff, but let's just wear the stuff we've got until it wears out. I'm guilty as anybody. I like clothes. Don't get me wrong. But actually, if we buy fast fashion, it will wear out quicker, and then we end up buying more stuff, and that will just end up going into landfill. But if you buy quality clothes that will last, then maybe we won't waste clothes. 
change a laundry cycle, only do a full load, a half rather than a half load. A single load of laundry that is washed and dried at the highest setting produces 7.27 pounds of CO2, one single load. Washing at 30 degrees centigrade produces 40% less electricity over a year. Here's a hardcore warning. Try get, I've never done it, but I read it. Try going on a plastic diet. MyLittlePlasticFootprint.org shows you kind of how to do it. The amount of people I really, really struggle to live in our society without any form of plastic. Computers. Here's the thing. What search engines do we use? Did you know your search engine can be environmentally friendly? Have you ever thought of the, heard of the search engine Ecosia? I use Ecosia. It's spelled E-C-O-S-I-A. That's .org. If you use that search engine, that search engine will plant a tree for every search done on its search engine. Well, even if only they've said they've done two million trees, even if it's only half right, that's a million more trees than searching on Google. So why not just use that search engine? Refurbish ink cartridges at back of church. From now on, there's going to be some cardboard boxes where our ink cartridges from our computers can be recycled. They go to companies and they get put in, uh, ink gets put in and then people buy them. Rather than buying our ink cartridges from the new places, have a look at refurbished ones to see whether they fit into your printer. They're also a ton lot cheaper. Turn off computers, use scrap paper. Richard is very good at that. Please speak to Richard afterwards. If you're going into town, walk or ride. Take your cone coffee cup to the coffee shop. Refuse plastic bags. Refuse plastic bags. Even with my click and collect, when I've said I do not want plastic bags in my click and collect, I still get plastic bags. They still have a policy where they put food in a clear plastic bag, and I'm like, and I literally just have to take all the food out of the bags and I give it to them and I just say, oh, sorry, I asked for no plastic bags. Make a point of it. Did you know driving the speed limit actually conserves fuel? Did you know that? So if you drive the speed limit, you can serve your... Did you know if you drive in third gear to help you drive the speed limit, it doesn't use up more fuel? And I know that because I was on a speed awareness course. And it was asked. And, I, and they went, well, put into third gear, and that will help you, rem you hear the revs, therefore you won't go over 13. I was like, okay, but doesn't that use more fuel? Look at me, Mr. Righteous. And he went, no. It's proven it uses no more fuel than going into fourth or fifth. I was like, oh, put it in my place. Let's use less fuel. Okay. Christmas. Did you know 23 million unwanted gifts end up in landfill every year? 23 million gifts. Outrageous. So rather than buying just a random gift, Dare I say, say to the person, look, I'm going to give you a gift, and the likelihood that this might go in the bin, I don't know, but I'm actually going to donate the money I would have given to you to charity to work towards something else. Or be really specific about the gift, find out it's going to be something really useful. Let's be creative. LED bulbs in our lights. Put things on timers. Don't use glitter paper or cards. Reuse old cards for tags. Here's one. Don't send any Christmas cards to people who you live locally with. Because what usually happens is they just get put in the, they get hung up, lovely, and it's very nice to receive something. But actually, they'll just get put in the bin. They get put into recycling, but just think about the process if you used to print those cards. What's wrong with saying, phoning somebody up and saying, look, instead of a card, I'm just going to phone you up and say, happy Christmas. How are you doing? That's pretty nice, isn't it? Now, I'm not expecting any Christmas cards from anybody this year now. They're all like, you told me not to send one to you, Neil. That's fine. I don't mind. Don't send Christmas cards. Just say happy, happy Christmas. Here's the biggie. Right, and this is the one who really is going to be big, and I'm going to end on here, Richard. Sorry, mate. Um, in the garden and the countryside, a lot of this came from Paul. Okay? So I don't know whether you've got a garden or whether you haven't. If you've got big lawn or small lawn, I'm lucky. I live in a vicarage that has a large lawn, and that's absolutely fine. But I won't always live in a vicarage with a large lawn. But there are things that I can do. 
Okay, so lawns. Allow a section of your garden to grow wild for a season. This helps pollinators. doesn't have to be the whole garden, but just don't mow it and let it grow and see what happens. Get to allow the bugs and the bees and everything to promote and go round. It promotes diverse lawns. It allows clover and diverse species of grass to grow. We're encouraged to stop adding fertilizer or weed killer to our lawns, to raise the cutting length up to, of the mower to reduce the presence of rosette forming weeds such as daisy and dandelions. Cut less often. Trees and lawns don't work well together, but don't sweep all the leaves away and throw them away. Create a mulch ring around the tree. So don't just let the leaves lie down saying, well, that's going to be great. Don't just gather them and chuck them, but create a mulch ring around the tree and let the leaves of the tree that's just fallen feed itself. Avoid insecticides. Now, this is Paul. Avoid insecticides at all costs. I won't try and read some of the words he said. Most pests have a high R number. Brackets, uh, we should all know what that is by now. They have a higher part R number than their predators. They will reproduce and become a problem. The predators will never catch up. Do you get that? So if we start putting stuff in, then actually nature can't do what it was created to do. And then Paul says, don't expect instant results. It can take up to five or more years for a sustainable garden practices to pay off. This is an investment in our life. This is not a click and collect moment in environment. Grow, grow your own. Yes, grow your own veg, but grow your own flowers. Florists are a major source of carbon emissions because it's imported from all over the world. If you don't have a garden, try a window box. Try something. Just a few flowers. How about this? Put up a bird box at the back of the church on the way out. Guess what these are made of? Organ pipes from St. Saviour's. Okay? We were getting rid of them. Rather than burning them, chucking them, we were giving away. We started to make some uh, bird boxes. Okay? Some more organ pipes just cut up. Okay? You could put uh, canes in there and they can be uh, bee nests for solitary bees. Hang those up in the garden loads of logs and stuff, drill holes into the logs, and away you go. Now, I've got a whole load of bird boxes over the, at the back there, different shapes and sizes. If you want one, please take one to hang up, um, but please donate to the church, because it was <laughs> given by the church. Um, it would be great. Um, and I've also got a whole load more of the pipes. If you want to have a go at making your own, feel free. Feed birds, absolutely right. But if we do this, we must promote from the ground up. Healthy, healthy active soil, microscopic invertebrates are fed by leaves and they grow nectar plants and basically all the stuff from the ground feeds our birds. So whilst we feed the birds, we've also got to make sure the ground stuff is working because that's where the birds will feed as well. So actually start looking at our ground up. Create wood piles in the back of the garden, sticks just on the floor, create stuff for them. Create an environment, conserve water. You've all got uh, water butts. Build insect houses, bee houses, peatlands. Did you know peatlands are, are, are home to rare plants, insects and birds? Did you know that? And they cover only 3% of the world's surface, but they hold 30% of soil carbon. In fact, it's said that peat bogs do more for pulling in carbon and storing it for thousands of years than trees do. Because when a tree is cut down, it releases the carbon. But the peat bogs store it for thousands of years. So when you get your compost, get peat free. Let's save our peat bogs. Plant a tree. Join the Wildfly, Wild, sorry, Wildlife Trust or RSPCB. Look at something where we can be proactive. Reuse plastic pots when we buy them from the garden centre, don't throw them. If you see somebody using a disposable barbecue on the commons, ask them not to, because that's where lots of the fires happen. You see, there is so much that we can do. And as a church, we are called to do this. And as a church, we've set up an eco group. We're looking at, we are now becoming part of the eco church. Richard and Julie and Jules are part of the eco team, if you want to see it that. If you want to be part of the eco team, how we move forward as a church, to do this, please speak to them. 
We are becoming a bronze award church for stuff that we're already doing, but we want to work forward to silver, to gold, and beyond. That We don't want to be people who just get awards and stay there and go, thank you very much, aren't we brilliant? But actually, we're seeking to look after our planet. The community fridge, Jules always needs more people to help with the community fridge. We're looking at changing our gas and electricity supplies, or we already are, to going greener. We'll be investigating solar panels. We're obviously starting to recycle. We're having ink cartridge recycling. I want you as a congregation to put up bird boxes. We're going to be looking at our carbon footprint as a church and offsetting that. When we finally come back and we can have coffee at the back, here's the thing. Could you bring your own cup, please? So we don't use the paper cups. Bring your own travel cup. We'll fill that. And then take it home and put it in your own dishwasher. Just makes life a lot easier and simpler trying to use less paper. If you're coming to church, if you live under one mile, why don't you walk? Or if you're driving, is somebody you can ask to give a lift to who you know needs to not come. You see, doing stuff is simply this. Do something, don't do nothing. I'll put all these things on our, on our website. But what can you do? Where can you start from? How can we live a simpler life? How can we live a life that responds to creation, that doesn't destroy it? but encourages it. That's where we're at. That's what I love us to do. And, you know, your personal response, we can, we're going to do the creation pledge in a minute, and then we'll probably end up with a song. But it's kind of like, do you know what? Our worship now is not just about us singing a song here and then going out. Our worship will be what we do outside of that door. That's how we worship through our lifestyle, a simpler lifestyle. I'll stop talking now, Richard, and you can swing in later and pick up the pieces of Neil. That's brilliant, wonderful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your creation. I thank you for all that you've done for us, the, the amazing variety that you've provided for us to stand in awe and wonder, but also to take care of. Lord, help us to take care of what you've given us. Bless us, Lord, as we do this. Inspire us and inspire others to do the same. In your name. Amen. Amen.